Bible books in 30 minutes. Through the Bible, book by book, with author, pastor and Bible teacher Mike Beaumont, who's talking to David Tavner. Having looked at the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, it makes sense to look at the Gospel of Luke. Quick question, first of all, Mike, is how different is Luke's Gospel to the other two? Well, he bases his basic story along the same storyline as Matthew and Mark. We said in a previous episode that most scholars think Mark, who based his story from Peter's account, was the first one, and that Matthew and Luke used that as a framework to both repeat some of his material, but add material that was of particular interest to them. So in many ways, it's very similar. In fact, scholars use a word for those first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. They call them the synoptic Gospels from a Greek word meaning from the same viewpoint. They they all come looking at the story of Jesus from the same angle. John's going to look at it quite differently. So in some ways, very similar. After all, you're talking about the same person. You're describing the good news that this person, Jesus, brought. And yet he, like the other two synoptic gospels, will have his own points of interest, the things that really sort of grabbed him about Jesus's ministry. And one of those, for example, in particular, was Jesus's compassion for the poor and for the outcasts, those on the margins of society, whether Jew or Gentile. And Jesus's um, interest in, obviously, prayer, talking to his Father and the role of the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, we've got the same story, the same storyline, but with some emphases that reflected Luke's particular interests. Fascinating the things that did interest him. I mentioned about his compassion for people in particular. We know from the book of Acts that Luke was a medical doctor. Mm. And so that's probably reflected, you know, God uses who we are Mm. and his compassion as a doctor ends up flowing out through this gospel. And we, we see him highlighting a lot of the places where Jesus showed compassion. So Matthew, of course, as we've said in a previous episode, was one of the eyewitnesses there with Jesus, one of the 12, and previously a tax collector. Mark, he was sort of a helper for Peter in the church in Rome as it developed. Luke, you say, was a doctor. So three different perspectives on this. And a perspective, by the way, this time from someone who was not an eyewitness, just picking up your point on the other two, being eyewitnesses, Mark through Peter, Luke is not an eyewitness. And so he opens his gospel by giving us, if you like, his credentials. Well, if you weren't there, how do we know that you're telling us a true story? And so he says at the beginning of his gospel, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. In other words, he's basing his account on eyewitness testimony and then goes on to say, therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, seem good to write an orderly account for you. So while he is not himself an eyewitness like Matthew and Mark through Peter was, he's gone back to source material, we would say. He has interviewed eyewitnesses. He has carefully investigated everything to produce for us this account. You reminded me that Matthew and Peter were Jews. What about Luke? Ah, now this is an interesting one because Luke is the only non Jewish author of any books in the New Testament. So he's not a Jew. So he's writing very much from a Gentile perspective, from the perspective of those who had been excluded, really, from the story and who now, through Jesus and his death and resurrection, are drawn in and included to the story. So how does that colour what he tells us, what he includes? Oh, he's going to do an awful lot of emphasis on Jesus reaching out and having... A heart for, as I said previously, the those who are on the edge, those who are marginalised, and and that will be a whole range of people. 
So, yes, the most marginalised people from a Jewish perspective were the Gentiles. The whole jolly lot of them didn't deserve to have anything of this gospel. But Gentiles find a place in this story, but also the marginalised Jews as well. Those that many Jews didn't have time for, we find in Luke's gospel uh, Jesus making a, a big place for even someone like in chapter seven, the widow's son that he raises from the dead. I mean, this is just someone, you know, poor widow. Why bother about her? Later in that same chapter, he allows himself to be anointed by a sinful woman, much to the dismay of the religious people around them. He will include in chapter 19, a story that's only in Luke's gospel, the calling of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, when he invites himself home for supper there. Now, as we saw when we looked at Matthew's gospel, tax collectors were incredibly despised people. But this is Luke's heart and passion and, of course, Jesus's passion. But he's picking up for us that this is a gospel for everyone who's on the margins, whether the Jewish margins or the wider Gentile margins. Is it also helpful to appreciate how much time is devoted in not just the Gospels, perhaps, but all the books of the Bible, to certain things? I mean, for example, in Luke's Gospel, the story of the birth of Jesus. Yes, we get an awful lot there, don't we, in the first um, sort of three chapters, the birth and the early years of Jesus's life. And I think what Luke is doing here is, although he is a Gentile, you know, he is rooting the story in what has gone before because he takes time, first of all, in chapter one to tell us about the miraculous conception and birth of John the Baptist. Why is that important? Well, because, you know, the Old Testament had said that before Messiah came, there would be a forerunner, and that is that forerunner goes on to talk then about the miraculous conception of Jesus uh, and how he was born. Uh, and again, this fulfilling of so much of what was promised there in the Old Testament. So, yeah, he, he's got a lot of interest in those sort of early beginnings of the story of Jesus. And as he was a medical doctor, I'm particularly interested in the fact that he's included references to the what we refer to as the virgin birth. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? You know, people were not naive in the ancient world. They knew as well as we do where babies come from. Uh, you know, and they didn't drop out of heaven or appear from under gooseberry bushes. They knew there was only one way babies came into the world. And yet, you're right, Luke, this medical doctor who would have been aware more than any where babies come from, goes out of his way to stress that it is through a miraculous intervention of the Holy Spirit there in chapter one, where God sends an angel to Mary and tells her that the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow her and she's going to give birth to a son and you'll name him Jesus. He'll be great and would be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asks the question that all of us want to ask, how will this be? Probably the question that Luke as a doctor had wanted to ask as well. And the answer is the Holy Spirit's going to do it. Yeah, we know this is not normal, but come on, if God is going to come into the world, then the fact that he would come in an unusual way is surely not that unusual. I've looked again at the way that he opens the gospel and it looks as if he's writing it actually for somebody called Theophilus. Yeah, that's right. In those opening verses, he says that he's done this careful investigation and interviewed the eyewitnesses and produced an orderly account. He says, for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. Now, who was Theophilus? Short answer is we don't know. But what we do know is the way he's introduced most excellent Theophilus is a term that was used for people of some standing. So he is some sort of dignitary, some sort of high official who seems to have become a Christian 
And that's why Luke wants to write so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been told. I want you to have a good foundation, we might say, for your Christian faith. Now, why address it to Theophilus? Well, you know, one of the things we forget today with our easy access to books and particularly to books on our phone at the touch of a button is that the production of a book or a scroll in the ancient world was an incredibly expensive procedure. Parchment was expensive. Hiring a professional writer was expensive. So this is not something that anybody and everybody could afford to do. And very often what writers did in the ancient world was to find some sort of sponsor who would pay for the work in exchange for it being dedicated to them. And that's probably what we've got here. Theophilus, a wealthy official of some kind, is the one who has put up the money to help produce this copy of the gospel, pay it for the parchment, pay it for the writers and the ink and all the other things. And so here's his dedication in the preface, as it were. And yet, do you know what? There's a little hint that Luke also knew he wasn't just doing it for him because the very word Theophilus means lover of God. And it's as if Luke is aware, yes, I've written this thanks to your <laughs> subsidy, O Theophilus, but actually I'm writing this for, for everyone who wants to love God, for every lover of God. Here is the story that you have enabled me to carefully research and record so that you and the faith of many others like you can be on a firm foundation. And because, as you said earlier, this is a message for everyone, good news for everyone, that seems to be a theme that's running through Luke's Gospel from what you said. How controversial was that? Oh, incredibly so. Because for Jews at the time, they had this conviction that they were God's people. Now, of course, that was right. He had said very clearly that he would take them as his people. We find that very clearly in Exodus chapter 19, when they are there at Sinai, he makes them his people. The trouble is, though, that had become a badge of pride, and God had never intended it to be a badge of pride. They were meant to be his people in order to carry his message to other people so that those outside his people could come and know him too and become part of his wider people. And over the centuries, Israel had frequently forgotten that. Many of the prophets actually challenged them about that. Many of the prophets saw at the end how it would be the nations who would flock to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. So there always was an underlying bigger vision. But, but really by New Testament times, particularly when you consider that Israel at this time was, was under a, a dominant foreign power yet again, as it had been many times under Rome this time, there was huge resentment of outsiders, huge resentment of Gentiles, huge resentment of Rome and its iron grip in control of the land that should have been theirs and very little heart for people outside. I mean, even among Jesus's own disciples at times, there was very little heart for outsiders. So on one occasion, they are going through Samaria and the people aren't very receptive to his message at that point. And some of the disciples say, Lord, do you want us to call down fire on them and have them all consumed? There was a reflection of what they thought these dirty non-Jews deserved. And yet Luke shows us in contrast to that common opinion that was there in Judaism, that God's heart was for way beyond that. And that comes out, well, in a number of, of ways, both the people that Jesus deals with, but in some of his parables in particular. Two sections come to mind. In chapter 10 of Luke, we get the parable of the good Samaritan. Is that a contradiction in terms? Well, it was for them because there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. Samaritans were 
dirty reprobates who'd broken away from the true people of God and built their own temple. And yet, in the story that Jesus tells in answer to the question, who is my neighbor? The people who pass by, first of all, a priest and the listener to this parable would have thought, oh, yeah, he'll definitely stop now. And he doesn't. And then a Levite, those who help the priest, comes by and the listener would have thought, oh, yeah, he, he's the one who will help. No, he doesn't. Who is it who helps? It's the Samaritan. A Samaritan who's good, a Samaritan who gets down and helps the man who's been attacked and binds up his wounds and takes him to an inn and pays the innkeeper and says, and I'll pay you more if you spend more than this when I pass through next time. It's the outsider, the non-Jew who is included. In chapter 15, Luke gathers together for us three parables about lost things. A lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son. And in each case there, the owner leaves what they have, leaves that which is already there to go and find that which is lost. The 99 sheep are left safe in the pen while the shepherd goes out hunting for this one lost sheep. The coin, she has others which are kept safe, but she goes looking for that one that's lost. The lost son, yeah, there's the good boy who stays at home with dad, but dad is longing and looking for the one who has gone away and whom he's longing to come back. So through things like these parables, Luke is showing us that God's heart, of course it includes Israel. How could it not? They have been at the heart of the story. But Israel is about to get transformed. Its boundaries are being expanded to now include Jew and Gentile who will come to God through Jesus. And being a doctor, a medical doctor, he would have helped to treat, I suppose, people from all aspects of society. And you've hinted there that there were many outsiders, many people who were overlooked. Who else then is is? included in, in Luke's account of Jesus's life. Do you know what? This might sound strange to us, but here's one who's included in chapter 18, children. <laughs> There's the story of how people are pressing through the crowds to bring their kids just for Jesus to lay his hands on them and, and to bless them. And the disciples are saying, no, no, sorry, the master's too busy for all this. Got an important meeting going on here. Don't want children interrupting the meeting. Good job we've never said that in churches, isn't it? And Jesus says, no, 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 don't stop them coming to me. Actually, it's to people like this that the kingdom of heaven belongs. Now, we might think that's normal, but, you know, children were not seen as of the same value as an adult in the culture at this time. So even down to things like children, we've already said Zacchaeus, the Roman collaborator, tax collector, uh, the, the widow's son who's raised from the dead, the, the woman who anoints his feet. There's a huge breadth in Jesus's compassion for those who are on the edges of life. If people are listening to this talk today and, and are feeling they're on the edge, they are marginalized. You know what the truth is? You might be by society because of your past life or your social circumstances or your job or where you live or all sorts of things. But I want you to know today that Jesus revealed to us in this gospel does not exclude you, does not marginalise you. And with him, you are most welcome. You said at the very beginning about the emphasis on prayer, Jesus and prayer. Tell us a bit more. One of the things we often find Luke mentioning is how Jesus himself goes to pray. And you'll find prayer coming up again and again in this story. One of the first places we find that is as he starts his ministry from Luke chapter four, the story known as the temptation of Jesus. And there the Holy Spirit leads him out into the wilderness. And there he's tempted by the devil, but he's gone out there to spend time with his father. That, that's all prayer is. You know, sometimes we put prayer into this sort of special category. I, I simply define prayer as prayer is conversation with my father. 
doesn't have to be in a special place or at a special time or in a special posture. It's chatting to your Father God as you go through your day. So even right at the beginning, Jesus is setting up his whole ministry by putting it on a foundation of 40 days of prayer and fasting, of seeking God diligently, of wanting to catch his father's heart. Because remember, prayer is not just about, well, here's my long list of things for today, Lord, that I'd like you to do, which, you know, if we're honest, is often what prayer can become for us, can't it? it prayer for Jesus was going to get away with his father and catch his father's heartbeat and listen to it and and hear what his father had to say to him as well. So even from that very beginning, uh, Luke is setting this up as a theme that will keep popping up as you read through the gospel. So as you read through, look for that theme of prayer popping up. How surprising was Jesus' example of prayer in the world in which he was living? Every good Jew knew about prayer. Of course they did. From being small, they would have learnt prayers that they would have recited. Every meal began with prayer. There were set prayers that they had each morning and each evening. There were prayers in the synagogue. But a little word I use there, set prayer, perhaps sums it up. Devout Jews were a very prayerful people, but there were so often these set prayers that had been passed down by tradition. Now, please let me be quick to say there is nothing wrong with a set prayer, but there is a danger with set prayer, and that is that it becomes a routine, that it becomes something you can churn off. So you learn the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know, it's so easy to do this. And what Jesus models for us is, yeah, that phrase again I use, that prayer is conversation with our Father. And he, he modelled for his disciples uh, this ability to talk to God, to use your ordinary words. You do not need special words to talk to God. It, you know, if someone's listening to this and they're not sure, well, I don't know how to talk to God. Listen, you talk to God just like you talk to anyone else. You use your ordinary words. You you relate to him as a dad in heaven and you just share your heart with him. Oh, and you also listen to see if he's got anything to say back. And one of the best ways to listen is actually to read his word and to see what he might say through there. So Jesus knew the set prayers. He would have been brought up with them. He was trained in them. He would have used them. But yet prayer is a much more expansive thing for him. It really is the whole sharing of life in any and every situation. And that's what he trained his disciples to be and do. So Luke's account of Jesus is, is pretty comprehensive. It, it goes right through from, from his birth, through his life, through death and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. It really is comprehensive, as you say. So it starts with those sort of infancy narratives, the birth, his childhood, then his preparation for ministry. Then chapters four to nine, we get his ministry in Galilee. And nine to 19 is the journey that he starts to make to Jerusalem, going through uh, Samaria and then ending up with his ministry in Jerusalem itself in chapters 19 to 21 and the increasing opposition to him until we get the, the sort of the final hours of his life, right from Judas agreeing to betray Jesus at the beginning of chapter 22 through the Last Supper and praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter's denial and Jesus's arrest and his being mocked and crucified and died. But buried and risen from the dead on the third day and resurrection appearances in chapter 24, whereas Mark ends very suddenly. 24 is full of different resurrection appearances that Jesus did and then ending with the ascension. So it starts with his coming. It ends with his going. It's all encompassing in between in terms of the people that he is reaching, the message that he is sharing. It really is, yeah, an all-encompassing gospel, this. And we said earlier that he spent quite a bit of time on the birth of Jesus 
And you're saying he spends quite a lot of time talking about the death, resurrection, and appearances of Jesus as mm. well. So there's obviously some real importance in, in those parts of the life of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely, because the birth narratives bring home to us who is it who has come to be this saviour? It is none other than God himself. Who is it who dies on the cross for us? Wow. It is none other than God himself. And so sort of the beginning and end of the story is really a punch on the nose to wake us up for who this story is about. This is no one less than God coming to us. This is Jesus, the one who became truly a man. There's a lot, by the way, in Luke's gospel about Jesus's humanity. He was a real man. So look for that when you're reading. You'll see little hints here and there of how he underlines that he was truly a man. Yet he was a man of the Spirit. Look to for work of the Holy Spirit in this gospel. See how Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit completely and how he promised the Holy Spirit to those who followed him. And it's this God who became man who taught and lived and did his miracles by the power of the Spirit, who will offer his life for us on the cross at the end, but whom God will vindicate by raising him from the dead on the third day. If you were Theophilus, would you come to the conclusion that Luke hopes you would? Oh, I very much hope so. I mean, he says, I've carefully researched it. And you know, that's absolutely true. Wherever Luke can use an accurate geographical or social term or a, a term uh, of about a governor or a procurator, uh, Romans were very particular about having their titles for different things, governor, procurator, and so on. He gets it right every single time. Archaeologists reveal that to us. So it's like you've got this absolute conviction. He did his research well and he told his story thoroughly. And I think what we end up with is exactly what he wanted for Theophilus, a well-researched, well-written, comprehensive story of how God came into this world in the person of Jesus, showed incredible compassion through his action, his teaching, his healing, his praying, how he opened his arms wide to all on the margins of society and let them know that God is really like that father in the parable of the prodigal son, eager, waiting to welcome us home. And there is nothing more, this gospel shows us, that God loves than throwing a party when his children come home. And when you get to the end of Luke's gospel, is that the end? Well, it's not the end because he's going to give us a part two. The story ends with the ascension of Jesus and the disciples going back to Jerusalem. But we're going to see in a future episode his work and his research hadn't finished because Luke wrote a second volume. It's what we call today the Acts of the Apostles. How do we know? Because that book too starts by addressing it to Theophilus, and he says, in my former book, Theophilus, I told you all about what Jesus began to do and teach. Now I'm going to tell you all about what he continued to do after his ascension through the Holy Spirit and through his church. But for that, you're going to have to wait for another episode. Mike Bowman has been talking to David Taverner. Listen to more episodes anytime. Bible books in 30 minutes. Through the Bible, book by book, from Genesis to Revelation, this is a United Christian Broadcasters production. For more about UCB, check out the website at ucb.co.uk.